collecting inbound sensor beams. As long as we're drifting silent, we'll have the same return signature as the rest of this alien debris. Mathematical proofs, you I mean, look at Fermat's last theorem, right? Mathematical proofs can be enormously complex and lengthy. So, when you rush forward as if things are self-evident, I assume you're trying to pull one over on me. A and you are. And again, I'm not saying it's conscious, and I appreciate this as an example, and I'm not saying you have any negative or malevolent intent, of course. But I'm just saying, you know, have a little foreplay before you screw me, you know? I'm not saying it's got to be a, a whole wall of flowers and a whole tray of chocolates, but, you know, maybe open a door or two before you tell me my shoes are untied and grab the Vaseline. So, then you go on to say, when a new moral framework is conceived, it has to overthrow an existing moral framework. So, again, when a new moral framework is conceived, I don't know what you mean by moral or framework. I can I mean, obviously, you could, we could say UPB or a moral theory. What do you mean by conceived? Uh, moral frameworks are not conceived. Unless you're using moral to be a descriptor of what people claim to be moral and not what is actually moral. A lot of people will claim things to be moral that are not moral. A lot of people will claim that it's moral to beat your children circumcise your children, your sons. Uh, a lot of people will claim that something is moral when it's not moral. So I don't know if you mean a moral framework like just what people claim is moral or a moral framework that's actually moral, in which case a true moral framework, a valid moral framework, is not conceived but proved. I didn't conceive of UPB, I proved UPB. So again, I'm not sure what you mean. It has to overthrow an existing uh, moral framework. Why? Why does it have to do that? Why? 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 <laughs> Why does the new moral framework have to overthrow an existing moral framework? There have been tons of moral frameworks that have been conceived that have never gone anywhere, right? So we haven't really heard of them. Now, if you say, if you were going to say when a new moral framework is conceived, it has to overthrow an existing moral framework in order to succeed, or whatever it is, right? And you go on to say, and if the adherents of the old framework aren't happy to be labeled as evil or lacking morality, they will fight the new framework tooth and nail. Does this mean that introducing a new moral framework requires a compromise on some issues in order for it to even have the chance of being widely adopted? Uh, well, of, of course, you, you absolutely need compromises in the promulgation of a new moral framework. And I, I, we're just going to assume that the new moral framework re re refers to UPB here, right? So, Yeah, of course, absolutely. It, uh, UPB, of course, defines a lot of things as immoral, but uh, UPB also says that until something is proven to people, they exist in a state of uh, nature with regards to morality. So uh, even though they may have an instinct for the kind of hypocrisy uh, that, that is occurring in the existing moral corruption framework, um, they are in a relative state of nature regarding the new morality. So it's going to take a while for them to be proven and so on. Like if I were to say, uh, I don't know, everything that's funded on debt is immoral, which, you know, it is, right? Everything funded on, on government debt is immoral because it's exploiting the next generation for the greed of the present, right? We understand that. So if I were to say that everything that is funded on intergenerational debt is immoral, then would I then have to say everything that has arisen out of government spending that has not been paid for is immoral? Well, that's the internet, that's TCPIP, that's the whole uh, framework, that's the World Wide Web, so I wouldn't Security. be able to use it, right? So, yeah, of course you have to make some, I can, uh, the, the, the roads, you know, uh, the, I did a presentation uh, at uh, a university many years ago uh, about how the U.S., Interstate highway system came about under Eisenhower. It's, it's still being paid off, right? It's still being paid off. In, in fact, England only recently ended, ended up finishing off paying for ending slavery. Because nothing says, let's all be virtuous, than an entire society and culture ending slavery worldwide and being blamed for slavery <laughs> forever and ever. Amen.
Uh, people that don't know what they're doing. So, uh, yeah, of course, there is a compromise. Right. Uh, there, is, there is a compromise. System neutralized. So, yeah, I mean, I, but that's say, saying that, you know, saying that you need, like, let's say you have a new theory of physics that you want to teach to students, you're going to have to find some way, I mean, prior to the internet, right? Really, you'd have to find some way to, to get access to the students, let's say it's a university level, you'd have to find some way to get access to the students, you'd have to be invited in. Yeah, there would have to be some, some compromises, so. All right, he goes on to say, this is like a presidential candidate compromising some of his stance on particular issues in order to be more acceptable to the public. Or as you've once said, are there any public philosophers who aren't fighting one evil while appeasing another one? Even with the abolition of slavery, the racial discrimination continued through state power. I understand that philosophy is more for the future than the present. I'm just curious how a philosophical movement survives the test of time when it relies on people in order for it to get to the future. We only see the successful religions, for example, but we don't see all the religions that fail to gain traction. And a part of me wonders if there is more to morality than providing a rational proof, especially since the means of transmission is social. Uh, I understand you haven't stopped at a rational proof either and have applied it to many facets such as parenting, relationships, psychology, and history. I also struggle to consider what could be compromised on here without losing something essential about UPB and NAP, which is the, you know... Oh, Lord. But at the same time, I have doubts about the future success of these ideas when faced with the seeing the momentum of social norms and institutional forces. It is no compromise, the answer, or is my ambivalence warranted? Oh, Lord. I, look, I don't mean to be rude, sorry, but I mean, honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm pushing 60, right? I mean, 58 this year, right? I mean, I, I don't mean to be rude, but God, man, what a load of, what a load of ookie cookie. Um, this is the big, it's the big moral issue in your life, is it? This, the long-term effects of compromises of other people in a new moral framework that's Come on, man. That's the big thing that... Well, I have solved every other issue. Nobody... No children in my vicinity or neighborhood are being maltreated. I've talked to everyone about UPB and peaceful parenting and a free society and voluntarism and everybody... Like, I've pushed all of this forward and blah, blah, blah. And so the only thing that's left for me, since I have done absolutely everything in my environment and under my control to push forward truth, virtue, reason and evidence and, and morality, the only thing is left is to figure out what, what are the effects of various abstract compromises going to be on this philosophical system over the next few hundred years? <laughs> oh my god. Man, I know a dodge when I hear it. I know a dodge when I hear it. Yeah. I mean, you literally refer to me having difficult conversations with people about philosophy over the last, well, really, it's been 40 years, but publicly close to 20 years. So you literally have this example, and, and what are you doing? Yes, but what percentage of compromise could possibly be necessary to fully advance the cause over the next half a millennia? <laughs> oh, my God. You know we're in a fucking plague, right? You know we're in a plague. And people are dying. And people are abusing children and abusing each other. And being thrown into the bottomless pit of dysfunction and neglect. They're getting addicted to drugs. They're turning like rabid wolves on their fellow citizens. We saw that under COVID. So you know that we are currently in a play. Now, you don't have to lift a finger to help in the time of this plague, though, sorry, by now, you and everyone who's listening to this, you have the cure. And the cure is to expose the moral hypocrisies and encourage those around us to be moral at whatever level of personal effect 
we can have. Maybe, maybe not at work, because that's not what you pay for at work, but certainly at a personal level. That's the cure. And that cure is available to all of us. You don't have to be eloquent, you don't have to be a public persona, you don't have to write books, although that wouldn't hurt, but you can talk to people about reason, virtue, truth, honesty, evidence, and morality. You can spread UPP, you can spread peaceful parenting, you can spread voluntarism, you can spread the non-aggression principle, you can spread the respect for property rights among the people you know, the people you meet, friends, Shotgun family, ammunition. acquaintances, and so on. You can post about it online, you can reply to people, you can incrementally push forward the acceptance of true virtue where if you want now, you don't have to do any of that, of course, right? I think it's wise to do it. Will it stop what's coming? Probably not. Does it lay a foundation for the future? Yes. Is it breadcrumbs to a free society? Yes, and even in the storm of the social world, those breadcrumbs will remain visible. But you do it not because you have certainty of victory. You do it because it's true. And if the only morals that were ever advanced would be those with a certainty of victory, we would have zero fucking moral progress whatsoever in the world throughout history. Critical. In perpetuity. Nothing would be done. Repaired. Most businesses fail. Does that mean we should not try to create new arenas of productivity in the world? The reason we advance philosophy, reason, empiricism, and virtue is not because the victory is certain. It's not. It's unlikely. In the short run, in the long run, it's more likely. The world tends towards consistency in the same way that, you know, everyone thinks hodling is uh, in crypto is like straight up. It's like, no, nope, ah, right, we're currently going through a bit of a bump down and in Bitcoin and so on, right? So it's only when you zoom out does it look smooth. It's a whole bunch of ups and downs and craters and peaks, right? But we advance truth, reason, and morality, sometimes even at the expense of our pretend relationships. And you can only have relationships based on virtue. Everything else is mutual avoidance and exploitation. So why do we advance uh, morality and virtue? We advance morality and virtue to gain better relationships ourselves, which is really our only chance of surviving social upheaval anyway, as I write about in my novel, The Future, uh, The Present, sorry. And also, and also the reason we do it is because if we don't do it, oh, our conscience will turn our life into hell itself. Key code recovered. Like, sorry, if you're interested in what I say, you have a conscience. Because you have a conscience, like an ancient angry god, you must bring it sacrifices. You must bring it sacrifices in the same way that they took stone daggers and ripped open goats to feed to the thunder gods in the past. You must bring your conscience a regular conveyor belt parade of bloody sacrifices. And the bloody sacrifices you feed to your conscience are all the lies in you and in me. All the falsehoods, all the hypocrisies, all the avoidances, all the cowardices, you must bring them and cut them from neck to groin, open up their entrails, and sacrifice all that is bullshit about you to the bottomless greed and more, and furnace breath and volcano crater of your conscience. Your conscience demands you sacrifice your lies to feed its kindness, because if you do not sacrifice it, your lies to your conscience, you will sacrifice your truths to your conscience, in which case it will fuck you up like nobody's business. You have a God that demands food. It demands sacrifice. The God is not you or me or anything. The God is the conscience, which is our innate capacity for universalization. What makes us most deeply human 
is universal abstract concept formation in the realm of morality, which we cannot escape. That is called the conscience. Why do people get so mad at UPB? Because UPB allies with their conscience and makes them feel bad. And because they are immature fools, not you, others, because they're immature fools, they think that because I talk about UPB, which allies and provokes their conscience and makes them feel bad, I'm a bad person because I'm hurting their fifis. The God of your conscience demands sacrifice. You either feed it your lies or the truth. You either feed it that which is most corrupt about you or you feed it that which is most honorable about you, but feed it will. You either throw it the bodies of your enemies or you throw it your loved ones, but feed it will. Now, what is this? What is this? What is this? This is a lie. Is it an interesting question? Yeah, somewhat. And I have no problem, and maybe you have done all of this, but I doubt it. I have no problem with a hobby as long as you've done your fucking job, right? I have no problem with you having a hobby as long as you've done your job. But if you come to your place of employment where you are supposed to be selling widgets and you set up your model train set, your boss is gonna have a problem. Your boss, of course, is not me. It's your conscience. If you want to dabble in these kinds of questions, fine. But do your job first, which means spread virtue and talk about virtue with those around you. Talk about what is truth and real and moral and virtuous with those around you. Now, we can't do that 24-7. So once you've done that to some reasonable degree, I don't know what that is, depends on people. If you've done that, if you've lived philosophy and talked philosophy and not bullshitted about philosophy, and I say this with great sympathy because I bullshitted about philosophy. For the first 15 years I studied it, it was abstract, interesting, fascinating, a bunch of wheels spinning in clouds that never had the temerity to touch the actual earth. I got no traction. I was wasting time. Now, I forgive myself for all of this because it wasn't like I was overburdened with examples of people who actually put philosophy into practice on any kind of regular or daily basis. So I had to invent those wheels by myself. For better or for worse, for better as a whole. And I'm not saying nobody ever done it. I'm just saying that I did not see it. And therefore I had to invent it. I say this with sympathy, I really do, and I'm giving you the speech I sure wish some philosopher had given me at the age of 15 or 16. It would have saved me a lot of pain and waste. Philosophy is for talking like cookbooks are for eating. You can't eat the fucking cookbook and you can't philosophize by talking. It's actions. The actions being, and I know this is like, well, but you're talking to other people. It's like, but the actions being honesty in your relationships. That's the action of philosophy, is honesty in your relationships. And refusing to compromise on what you know to be right, no matter what the situation. If you don't feed your conscience your lies, it will start with your loved ones and end with you, that you will be the last to go into the furnace. And unfortunately, and this is where hell comes from, hell is the conscience that has been fed the truth. Hell is the conscience that it's been fed the truth. Because you lose all leverage and credibility in the world and you have betrayed that which you know to be true and good for the sake of that which is convenient and merely social. If you have done 
the maximum that you can reasonably do in the time that you can reasonably allocate to the spreading of virtue, truth, reason and evidence. Absolutely. Indulge in and enjoy these questions. If you've done your job, go play some pickleball. And if you've done your job and you and I go to play pickleball and you have some questions about pickleball, fantastic. Fantastic. But if you need to work and you need to eat and you need to pr provide for your family and your children and you come to me all day talking about pickleball, I'll say, hey, don't you have a job? Don't you have a job you have to do? No, 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 I want to talk about the pickleball. It's like, but your children are hungry and you can't feed them with pickleball. Do I find the questions interesting? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Can we indulge ourselves in these recreations? Absolutely. I uh, did 15 minutes of a Twitch video game to warm up for this show. Nothing wrong with that. I enjoyed the video game. But if all I'm doing is video games, I'm missing the point. And I say this knowing that I'm out on a very thin tree limb of assumptions, but I'm going to have to go with my instincts here. Reason and instincts and emotions all work together when you get it right and you're in the flow. The lie that you're feeding your conscience is this is your most important question. This is the most important thing to answer to save the world. It's not. It's recreation. It's, enjoy it's an enjoyable waste of time. It's time well wasted. And indulge away if you've done the work in your environment, within your personal relationships. But I don't think you have. And that's the con. Right? Remember I said at the beginning there's a con here, and I'm not saying it's conscious. I'm not accusing you of any malevolence. But that's the con. The con is, Steph, you want to focus on this. I want you to distract you with this. Now, what are you distracting me away from? What's the person bumping into me so you can take my wallet? What is the hand of the magician that is hiding the actual transfer? It is that by asking me this question, you are trying to get me to think and my audience to follow that assumption that this abstract nonsense which can't be answered in any particular clear way, which we all have to navigate to some degree instinctually, and it changes for every single person. What I have fewer compromises to make than somebody who works for the government. I have fewer compromises to make than somebody who works in an office.
system neutralized. System neutralized.
With an HR department. So it changes for everyone. So rather than spread virtue among those you know, you want to pursue an impossible to define percentage of compromise as if that's the most important thing. Nice try, my friend, nice try. Go get some lies to feed to the volcano god and speak more truth. Key code recovered.
neutralized. Hull repaired. Hey, uh, I would I would just throw it out there. Not necessarily good friends. You know, like a good friend will be honest with you. Yeah, rotating phaser. You literally right, right as I'm saying, it, a good friend will. Like, you know, like a good friend won't do it in front of people. A good friend the next day will talk to you, right? Like, if you're in a group of people, you should never call out somebody unless if it's like that egregious. Um, but generally, a good one-on-one -on -one conversation, if you actually think someone's being deluded, like a good friend will take the time to be like, yo dog, like this is, this ain't, this ain't, this ain't good. You know what I mean? This ain't good. Okay, Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Aristotle, with your friendship definitions. Mr. Aristotelian guy over here. Now, how I came off to them. Here was this kid who hadn't paid his dues in life. He didn't have a job. He hadn't worked hard or accomplished anything of note. And he had a right to complain about job prospects. No one was going to tell me how misguided my thinking was. It was up to me to fit. By the way, someone should have. Again, good friends would tell you that you're goofing up, okay? Key code. I mean, for me, in fact, that statement right there is actually more of a condemnation of the people he was surrounded with than himself, right? You're equally deluded if you think friendship is just about having good times. Like, that's no real friend. It just isn't. That's not a real friend. That's a chum. <laughs> that's, a, that's a bud. Right? That's not, uh, it's not, that's not, that's not real. Facebook friends act this way. Exactly. You're a Facebook friend in real life. Figure it out on my own. In yeah. the next few months, my job search became increasingly difficult. I was not aware that Fair weather friends most like companies that. tend to slow down their hiring process Eco. at the end of October Eco. in preparation for the holiday season. <laughs> this was yeah, something that, that caught me completely off guard. And the true... Welcome to the real war, bitch! <laughs> I mean, that does happen. It's very, very true. Typically, you don't want to change a lot right before the holiday season. The pressure of the situation began to set in. It had been nearly five months since I graduated college, and I wasn't even close to getting a job. I found myself submitting dozens of job applications per day. I wonder if he was building things. I, he hasn't addressed it, I don't think. He's talking about the low. Uh, I wonder if he was like building things. Like how was he preparing or what was he doing to change? I hope that he uh, covers that. Cause that's like my big thing I keep thinking about was what was the moment? while going through online forums, Reddit, or just any- Someone is asking, well, curious about real friends. Dude, just go Aristotelian on it, right? You gotta have location, proximity of things you enjoy, and ability, like, an ability to have tough conversations, right? It's pretty simple. Like, it's really hard to be long distance friends. It just is. It's just simply like, if you don't live near each other, if you can't see each other, it just, it, it does become harder. If you don't have shared interest, it becomes even harder. It just does. Like, that's, like, just, like, I mean, dude, some dude 2,000 years ago with a beard and, and marble statue said that. He's probably, he's probably right. Good friends aren't common. Anything to look for advice on how to get a job. I was told to study leak code, to learn web frameworks, to build side nice. projects, okay. to network oh, with other it. people for referrals. And I just began to get completely overwhelmed. Okay. by the number of things I needed to do to get a software job. And I realized there were people out there -watch. that studied -watch. 10 times harder for 10 times longer and still were unable to get a job. And despite this, I mean, I say this all the time, which is like, if you're not willing to go really deep and really hard, wow. like, just remember, there's always someone that's willing to work harder than you. Now, you don't have to be the hardest worker. You don't have to be the most aggressive learner. But there's always somebody that is willing to go harder than you. That their life circumstance is more desperate than yours. And desperation will make people work much harder. But you just gotta understand that when going into it, which means that you have to be willing to put in some hours. I 100% couldn't be the engineer I am today without the countless weeks of 80 hours. I'm not saying it's great. I'm not saying it's perfect. I'm not saying it's the way life should be. 
but there's also a reality to the situation. Me submitting hundreds of applications, I received very few responses. In the month of December, I was able to secure two on-site interviews with startup companies in San Francisco. In one of the interviews, the interviewer ended my technical screen early, probably because of my performance. And it As someone who's given many interviews, many, many interviews, including many at Netflix, hundreds at my previous job, you just got to understand when someone says, hey, you know, I'm not too sure about this, why are you using that? Or some phrase like that, right? What they're saying to you is, hey man, you aren't doing this right. Let's take a step back. Let's try to think of a new way to approach the problem. Shield Current way, skill issues, okay? You're skill issuing hard right now. And I'm giving you like a little warning, a little red flag that you're skill issuing. Let's walk back a little bit. Instead, opted into having a friendly conversation with me. He asked me the question, so what did you do in school? I knew what he was asking me. Failing interviews, it was painful, but that was nothing compared to seeing the disappointment in my parents' eyes. I couldn't help but think of the sacrifices they made to immigrate Oof to this country, working hard to attend school here. The Asian moment people talk about, yeah, people talk, I've heard many people talk about this. <sighs> you know, that's one thing that I, I love about my mom. She was so proud of me that I just, that I, I wasn't using drugs, right? Like that was like, she was so happy. You know, and there's, there's something magical about having a parent that just loves you. <sighs> you know, even, even when you're still a disappointment, they still love you, you know what I'm talking about. There's something very, very nice about that. To find a job here and to leave everything behind, to make a better life for their children. And as I struggled to find a job, as I submitted 600 job applications to almost every company I could find in the state of California, I couldn't help but feel like I was letting them down. And at the same time, letting myself down. People real. don't change it's real right there. unless they go through a heavy amount of self-reflection or they are forced to by circumstance. Ironically, this whole situation about me not being able to find a job, it was jarringly similar to an experience I had just four years previously. Instead of a job search, I was in high school and I was trying to get into top colleges. I had spent most of my high school years procrastinating, neglecting my grades, I typically like to brag that I did one day of homework in all of high school. I got a 2.16, not a big deal. Not a big deal, NBD. There's reasons why I may have gone to Montana State University. Just throwing that out there. I had a media. Key code recovered.
code recovered. Key code recovered. mediocre at best college application and yet I thought I had a chance to apply and get into top colleges because that's what my friends were doing and when the time came to receive college acceptances I found myself rejected by almost every school I applied to. I remember one of my SAT tutors sat me down and told to never put myself in a situation where I wasn't preparing for the future ever again and while some of that message might have stuck with me for a bit. Obviously, none of it stuck long-term. People don't change unless they are forced to change. There's some, you know, it's funny that he remembers that statement. Isn't it funny how sometimes you'll have those moments with somebody where they say something to you and you know it's good advice, but it like, there's this old adage that says the greatest distance in the universe 
is the distance between your head and your heart. And sometimes it's true, you know? Sometimes it takes you 